Uh, hello, everybody. I see some familiar faces and non-familiar faces. So in the back of the room is um, Dr. Mike Conboy. And all of this research is done together by both of us. Uh, also, my title is Professor of Bioengineering. I have been recently promoted, so <laughs> I'm glad to, glad to inform you about that. OK, so it's typical to show on the first slide the picture of the university from which people are. And believe it or not, this is University of California, Berkeley, the way it looks from my office window. And I'm going to talk to you today about kind of the bird eye view on aging and rejuvenation. So the title of my talk is Plasticity of the Age, which means that typically you kind of assume that aging is going in only into one direction, right? So you are born with this young, healthy body, and then it becomes slowly deteriorated, less healthy, and old. And believe it or not, it doesn't have to be so. It can go in this direction, or it can go backward where you are younger. And I know that it's maybe very difficult to realize that this is, in fact, the case. For example, when I give this lecture to my students, they are very surprised. So they have this big, surprised eyes and facial expressions. But I always give them these uh, examples that, for example, just 200 years ago, if your leg gets infected, typically it progresses only in one direction, and eventually you might lose your leg. But for most of the people, it doesn't get better. But the, with the invention, invention of antibiotics, now it can go backward and it can get better. And in fact, many people expect to get better. And another example is that cell fate. We used to think that once cell fate is established and cell is a hair follicle cell or a skin cell, this is it. But now with IPS technology, we know that it could be reprogrammed and skin cell could turn into neuron or it could make the entire new organism a mouse with all of the cell types. So a couple of things which we thought are set in stone, in reality are not set in stone. And what I now firmly believe is aging is one of those things which just need to be added to this plate. So this is the example that I give. I think if I can maybe make this taller, You will see more of it. Yeah, you see more of it. I guess, no, it doesn't really go. You can put here. No. Yeah, it just like needs to be like that. So then they can see the, the title <laughs> of the slides. Yes. Oh, I see. Another, now it kind of yeah. looks silly, but oh, <laughs> that's okay. Here okay, we go. Okay. Exactly. This is now titles on the ceiling. There we go. But Let's get this out of the way. Okay. That's better. That's better. So this is example that I typically give to um, to let people know that we do not really understand what controls the rate of mammalian species aging. So here you see two animals. And we know that for all mammals, including people, the rate of organ deterioration and disease will rise exponentially with age. But if you look at the uh, squirrel at three years of age, squirrel will be very young and healthy because squirrels live up to 30 years. But rat, which looks pretty much like a squirrel, if you remove the bushy tail from the squirrel, it looks pretty much like a rat. At three years of age, you'll be full of disease and sick. Yes. Now, probably I can stay here. Is it good for you if I stay here? Yeah? Are you okay? Yeah. So, anyways, so if you look at the chronological age, which is three years, squirrel will be very young and healthy, and rat will be very old and sick. And what is the difference between those animals, right? They are the same size, they have very high metabolic rate, they live in the same pretty much environment, and they eat the same food. So that convinces me, or it gives an interesting idea, that aging is not just a progression of time. It is a regulated process, which is good for us, because if it is a regulated process and we understand regulation, perhaps we can slow down the aging or, or reverse it. 
By the way, don't feel, uh, feel free to interrupt and ask me questions during the time. So here how I perceive our bodies. So this is the metaphoric explanation for our bodies. We are really a mosaic of cells. Not all of our cells are of the same age. We have kind of average cells where we have damage and why? You can speak I can talk here? Is it better for you guys? It's better. It's better? Yes. Okay. All right. So, so <laughs> as a first speaker, I'm like going through all of this uh, <laughs> debugging <laughs> of the process. So yeah. So most of our cells are differentiated in our bodies. And as you know, they accumulate damage with age, which I'm not going to dispute, right? So you have telomere shortening and DNA damage, and proteins become misfolded and whatnot. And then we have senescent cells, represented here, which actually age worse than the rest. So they have a lot of damage, and they produce these horrible cytokines called senescence-associated secretory phenotype SASP. And they make even the entire cells around them to be worse. But in some situations, like wound healing, they are really needed. So many people are developing senolytics and they try to get rid of them. And we are working on this green sprite, which is stem cells. And what you found out is that stem cells remain relatively young, even in the old human or old mouse. They don't accumulate DNA damage. They activate telomerase just fine, and therefore maintain telomeres of the cells that they produce. And they don't accumulate any other type of damage. And if you activate stem cells even in an old person or old animal, they make young, healthy tissue. So now, when you look at yourself again, you will know that you are a mosaic of cells of different ages. Some people try to remove senescent cells, and we try to activate stem cells. So what we discovered in our work is that extrinsic cues can both robustly rejuvenate the old tissues or stem cells and prematurely age even young tissues and stem cells. Again, signifying that it is not simply a chronological time. You can do it very quickly in one month or perhaps even in one week. So this experiment started by heterochronic parabiosis and then continued by heterochronic blood exchange. Heterochronic parabiosis was never set up to uh, be therapeutic. Dr. Mike Conboy and myself set it up as a proof of principle. Can we quickly rejuvenate old mouse or will we also age the young mouse? And in fact, both happens. And it was interpreted very simplistically that there are some secret source young factors in young blood, which then, therefore, if you have an old person and you infuse them with young plasma or blood, that will make them younger. That has absolutely no experimental evidence or justification whatsoever. And as a result of that, alcohol trials were not successful, and ambrosia is not going anywhere, and I do not really know why anybody would interpret the outcome of parabiosis so simplistically. Because if you have a young mouse, it donates its organs to the old animal that is sutured to the young animal. So now old animal has young set of kidneys, liver, heart, and lungs working for it. So all of the toxins can be removed by the young partner, and young partner oxygenates the old blood. So now you have more oxygen to your cells, and you have a normal glucose and insulin homeostasis or balance as well. So you don't need to search for mysterious proteins to see how the old animal was rejuvenated. In blood exchange, we removed organ sharing. So this procedure actually miniaturizes FDA approved for human procedure, which is called um, therapeutic plasma exchange or apheresis. And we miniaturized it so we can screen a number of experimental conditions, trying to see how we can potentially reposition FDA approved apparatus for novel applications for age-related diseases. So here is no organ sharing. So in the even better, more elegant approaches, we believe that the way that we rejuvenate old animals very quickly in parabiosis or blood exchange, 
parabiosis takes few weeks, blood exchange is a single procedure, is that we reset productive signaling between stem cells and their surrounding tissue. And the signaling is controlled by known networks of uh, proteins called signal transduction. Those are listed here and there are many others. And what we think is that we are actually molecularly resetting the interactions between cells in the old animal to young levels. And once you molecularly or biochemically reset those interactions, tissues become younger. So it is not one silver bullet, whatever was proposed. It's a combination, combinatorial approach. It's in multiple factors. OK, so then the conclusion here is that it's really a paradigm shift from dominance of intrinsic aging, such as that, of course, you know, you go through life, and you accumulate damage, and you need to remove the damage to become younger, to actually extrinsic aging and showing that stem cells are only reversibly inhibited. They are not forever inhibited from their ability to repair and regenerate tissues. And the question is, how do you remove this reversible inhibition? And if you do that, and if 70-year-old person starts to regenerate tissues as well as 20-year-old, will you start getting younger? So some of the um, examples that I'm going to show you, and this is way too scientific, but I will go slow. So this is regenerated young muscle. It was experimentally injured in this area, and it repaired. And the old muscle did not repair. You have fibrosis. You can also see it in another way by marking this red protein, which signifies newly formed muscle fibers. And what you can see if you exchange young animal with young blood, it has good muscle regeneration as compared to old animal exchange with old blood. And old animal exchange with young blood just once improves a little bit in regeneration and has a little bit less fibrosis. And this is also true in parabiosis, but here we don't have organ sharing. And if you look at liver, you see that in young animals, there is significant liver regeneration, which is better than in old. And if young animal is exchanged with old blood, you see inhibition of liver repair by the old blood. And you see rejuvenation of liver repair in the old animal by the young blood. Furthermore, you may know or not, I don't know, the old livers are very adipose. So this is the staining for fat and liver as compared to young livers. And single blood exchange of old animals with young blood, just one procedure, removes liver adiposity significantly. And it also reduces fibrotic clusters, precancerous clusters in old livers. So again, I want to emphasize that this procedure has been approved by FDA for a different type of blood diseases and autoimmunity. And we are now working on repositioning it rationally to treat a number of age-associated disorders such as osteoporosis, neurodegeneration, and others because not only it is approved, but it's much safer than infusing somebody else's bodily fluids into yourself. Because your own blood is taken out, it is therefore rejuvenated by a number of modules that we are designing, and is returned back to you in a way that it promotes health instead of inhibiting health. So after um, this has been published, we had this uh, highlight about our work in our uh, economist, which you can see here as a cartoon. So the way I interpret it, there are a bunch of old people, and they try to sneak in into the blood infusion and steal young blood. And <laughs> again, I don't know why people interpret it so simplistically that all you need is young blood. No, you need to remove bad things from your old blood. But uh, for brain, situation is very different. And blood exchange of young mice with old blood inhibits their neurogenesis. But blood exchange of old mice with young blood does nothing good for them. So here is our old data that my convoy and I generated back in 2003, 2004, before the original 2005 Nature Parabiosis paper, which shows you the area of the brain, hippocampus, where you continue to make neurons, new neurons, as adults. So there are neural stem cells here in this particular region. They are shown as green dots or red dots. 
and they will divide and will make new neurons, and that's how you can learn new language or learn how to ski even when you are adult. And what you can see here is that young animals make about, in this particular quantification, over thousands of this, they have over thousands of these proliferating neural stem cells. And old animals have less than 25. See? This is how many proliferating cells to make new neurons are in a young animal. This is how many are in old. So that signifies decline in learning, memory, and cognition with age, or at least one of the reasons of such decline. And if you parabios young mice to old, you see some drop in neurogenesis. And if you parabios old mice to young, you see some increase, but they still make only 50 neurons and not 1,000 neurons. So these results were shared with Tony weiss Carey Laboratory back at Stanford when we produced them. And he then became interested and repeated this work and published it virtually the same figure in his 2011 Nature paper. So it is a very stable, robust finding. However, if you look at what happens in blood exchange where organs are not shared between mice, you see that, yes, young mice make many of these have many dividing cells in the hippocampus which will make neurons. Old mice do not. Infusing or exchanging old mice with young blood does not help them at all. Does not. However, infusing the young mice with old blood just once obliterates their ability to form new neurons. Obliterates it. And this will happen if you count just the dividing cells in a particular region, or if you use a marker of the cells, which is SOX2, doesn't, is not important for you. And it will happen whether the animals are injured in their peripheral muscle or they are not injured. By the way, if you have injury to the muscle, it has a bad effect on the brain. So whatever, however we injure ourselves peripherally, immediately negatively impacts neurogenesis. And particularly it impacts neurogenesis if you exchange young animals with old blood. So here it was making some neurons, which we set up at 100%, this one, and then it drops to here. So it immediately drops down. So the situation is different, and young blood doesn't seem to help old brain, but old blood immediately incapacitates young brain. So in a couple of my last slides, I just want to tell you about our approaches. Instead of taking one factor out of the head and claiming that this is the factor, be it GDF11 or TIMP2. We have more comprehensive and scientific approach to identify those factors which are present in parabiosis or blood exchange. We transfuse the animal with the entire gamish of blood. Can we identify which young proteins actually acted in old animal? So this approach is based on my sabbatical and David Terrell laboratory, which I took back in 2013. And David Terrell laboratory uh, pioneered this method called bioorthogonal proteome tagging. And what they did, they made this construct where normal methionine tRNA synthase is replaced by mutant methionine tRNA synthase. And so typically methionine tRNA synthase will bring methionine amino acid to your growing protein when you are expressing your genes. And this mutant for methionine tRNA synthase 274G, single point mutation, instead of methionine will bring your own label. So you can treat your animals with that label, and only animals that express this mutant will incorporate that label into their proteins. And immediately as I was listening to his lab meeting presentations, I said, let's make transgenic mouse and hook it up in parabiosis. Because if you do it, and this is what's shown here, that if you have B6 mouse, and it is connected to the methionine tRNA synthase mutant mouse, they could be in parabiosis, so they could be exchanging blood. But if you add your label, it will only incorporate into the proteome of this one mouse. And then if this mouse is young, you can identify which young protein or proteins tagged with your label traveled into tissue of the old animal and potentially can form rejuvenative candidates. You don't have to guess, you actually get them. 
So here is the schematic how we do it. We used um, antibody proteomics arrays, which in this case, you have 300 different proteins that you can profile, and you can profile as many as 1,000 proteins per one array. And in array, you have antibodies, which are specific to the protein. And if protein has this tag called ANL, you can click through click chemistry biotin, which is a small organic residue. And then biotin has, hmm? I think I turned off. Biotin has tag, um, has affinity for streptavidin, which is conjugated to fluorescence. So all of these interactions will happen only if your protein is tagged with ANL. And if it is not tagged, it will bind to the array, but you will not be able to see it fluorescently. And so here is the example of the arrays. And the paper has been published, so I'm not going to go through all of it. But the take home message of this paper is that it's not one silver bullet GDF11 or TIMP2 proteins that come from young animal to old. It's many of them. So leptin, leaf, Cerberus crypto, DKK, um, folistatin, and a bunch of other proteins that come from the young animal to old muscle can rejuvenate old muscle by usefully calibrating cell interaction molecular networks, which are shown here. You don't need to go into that in much detail, but they control cells self-renew, divide, or differentiate. And there are a bunch of them, a bunch of proteins. There are additional proteins which inhibit inflammation, and there are additional proteins which help to remodel tissue, such as make new vasculature and new innervation for the tissue. So that is kind of more what you would expect, is that you have a young animal, and it sends through common blood circulation a number of proteins, which then have a number of changes to make old animal younger. Now, we don't need to recapitulate all of them. We need to identify which ones are the dominant and could be used therapeutically for rejuvenative outcomes. Also, very interestingly, the same thing as with our neurogenesis studies. I was so excited about these results after from my sabbatical that I shared these results or ideas with my friends from Stanford. And lo and behold, they decided to do the same work. And I don't know, you know, it could be that great minds think alike, totally possible. Or it's possible that we have this additional influence on the field, which would be great, because ultimately we all work for the same cause. So we are kind of happy about it. And then the very last slide before my acknowledgement slide is uh, about P16. So we work in collaboration with Judy Campisi on multiple projects. And so I'm really interested in senescence, or I am supporter of this whole field of senescence. But this slide tells us that we have to be careful with senolytics, because this is the slice of the young muscle. So this is the young animal where muscle was injured. This is the injury site, and is now being regenerated. So now you make new muscle fibers, this new small green outlines with red circles in the middle. And all of the red here believe it or not, is P16. So P16, like any other gene, did not evolve to make us sick or old or dead. All of these genes play a role. And typically here, whenever cells go from dividing to differentiating, they upregulate P16 all over the body. And so if you start just indiscriminately ablating P16 high cells or P21 high cells or any other cells which express particular gene, the outcome could be less positive than expected. So we need to design very interesting engineering strategies to have specific timing of ablation or downregulation of anything that we want to achieve. So I will end here. Here are my conclusions. The positive conclusion is tissue stem cells remain numerous and functional enough even in an old person. And by boosting their capacity, we can actually start repairing ourselves and maybe aging slower or in reverse. And that this bone care technology that I discovered in my sabbatical and David Terrell laboratory would allow us to identify therapeutic candidates as well as drug targets to be neutralized or antagonized. So this is our lab. 
in the beautiful hills behind our house. And this is my dog and Mike's dog, Woofy, who is waiting in the car right now. And um, we are supported by a number of funding agencies, and we are recruiting. Thank you so much for your attention.